Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, three, as I said, very distinguished panelists and with a lot of experience uh, in interesting initiatives around the world. Uh, the first one is uh, Kate Oren, who is the Executive Director of Women's uh, em Environment and Development Organization. We do, is, is the right way to say it. It's a, a global advocacy organization for women and uh, uh, focuses quite a bit on human rights uh, issues. And interestingly, Kate also ran a theater in New York City for about 10 years uh, before uh, getting engaged in this work. Our second panelist is uh, Olimar Mesonet. Uh, she's the poly policy coordinator for Sustain US. She currently works for IREX uh, in Washington DC, which promotes access to technology and information in Eastern Europe, Latin America, and Africa. And our third panelist is uh, Gemma Bulos, uh, who's the director of Global Wom uh, Women's Water Initiative. Uh, and it's, uh, as, you, as the name says, it's a global initiative uh, which focuses on provisioning of safe water. And it uh, started with a project or initiative that she started in the Philippines, uh, which was called A Single Drop for Safe Water uh, in the Philippines. So please join me in uh, welcoming all three of the panelists. So as I said uh, in the beginning, uh, our interest is to bring about a discussion on uh, addressing this uh, really serious uh, global problem around uh, drinking water and sanitation. And as many of you would already know, that there are uh, about 780 million people who are without access to drinking water around the world. And this is access to uh, what we call uh, an improved source of water. Some of us think that the actual number of people who don't have access to running water around the clock when they need it, that number is probably close to about 2 billion. There's also about 2.6 billion people who don't have access to sanitation. And that results in uh, some very stark uh, and uh, somewhat depressing statistics. We have about 3 million people, between 2.5 and, and 3 million, who die each year from water-related diseases. About one and a half million of those are children. And it's something like uh, 3,000 children under the age of five dying every day. And think about it, uh, somebody described it uh, as a way of saying that there's uh, uh, something like uh, three or four jumbo jets full of children crashing each and every day. And uh, to uh, uh, not be able to address this very simple uh, problem I think is, is something that we have to really uh, take action on. And I think our three panelists here are uh, quite uh, amply qualified to, to talk about those issues. And we also think that uh, women can play a very central role in, uh, in addressing those challenges. And particularly because they are the ones who are the, on the one side water managers in most of the countries. And they're also the ones who are most uh, severely impacted. Many girls in developing countries cannot continue school even if they want to uh, once they hit the age of puberty because there's simply no toilet facilities that would allow them to, uh, to be at school uh, as, the, as their me menstruation cycle starts. So again, both in terms of uh, problems and solutions, I think women have a very central role uh, to play. So let me start with uh, asking each of uh, the panelists in uh, expressing how they've uh, viewed this challenge and what are some of the things that they've, they've done uh, to, uh, uh, to respond to this. So Kate, let's start with you and talk about We Do, uh, which is an empowering uh, uh, organization. How is it uh, focused on water issues and how, how that work has come about? Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, first, I, I just want to say it's such a pleasure to be here. We were, we were saying on the walk over here, um, well, certainly I, at we do, <laughs> and Olimar was saying she has a similar experience, spend a lot of time, a very wonky time at the United Nations and other decision-making spheres, and it can be a little tedious as much as we think the, the work is incredibly important. So just the, the morning that we've been here already has been so inspiring. So I want to thank and acknowledge all of you for that. Um, so we do. 
Uh, we do is the Women's Environment and Development Organization. We're an international women's global policy advocacy organization. So what does that mean? That means we spend a lot of time at the UN and other multilateral decision-making spheres um, trying to first and foremost get seats at the table. You know, if you have ever been to the UN or you see the movies and, and all the countries have their little name tag, we sit behind the women name tag. Sometimes Elise sits behind the youth name tag, but I'm sure she'll talk about that. Um, we Do was really founded, we were founded 21 years ago by an incredible group of international women visionaries, including Nobel laureate Wangari Mathai and U.S. Congresswoman Bella Abzug, um, because they saw a need, they saw a major gap in policy making, that there were all of these sort of siloed sectoral issues, and yet at the end of the day, human rights and gender equality and sustainability and justice, social justice, these issues were not um, the thread weaving all of them, all of these issues together, which they very much needed to be and, and should be, rather they were themselves also siloed issues. So we do's legacy and, and our work today is still very much about finding space for women, making sure that women's voices are heard, women's not only needs, but also capacities um, as leaders, as innovators, as educators, um, that those spaces are, are available in, in policy-making circles. Um, I've been working on water as a, a priority issue for a long, long time, and now our, probably our biggest thematic focus is climate change, really because our partners around the world, our network, insisted on it. We were hearing from every corner of the globe something is happening to our fields, to our water supplies, to our neighborhoods, to our families. We don't know what's going on, but something is happening and, and policy and programming and, and funding is not connecting the dots here. So we do took this on very seriously as a, as a challenge and it has been a challenge, but we've also uh, together with partners all over the world have made a lot of progress in, in connecting these multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder dots um, which, we're, which we're very proud of. Um, I, I will just give a, a quick example of how, you know, how do we connect women's stories to, to global decision-making spheres? What, what does that actually look like? What do we talk about? What, what is global advocacy in reality? Um, one of my favorite stories is a, a story from a friend of mine. She is, she's an incredible uh, disaster risk reduction and resilience and preparedness expert at the University of Hawaii, which is where I'm from. And um, she, uh, she's a, a specialist in the Pacific region. And she was in Micronesia. And Micronesia, this was about eight or nine years ago, and Micronesia was going through a terrible drought. And my friend, Cheryl, was, was being asked by the government and, and, and by all of these um, uh, companies coming in, you know, what are we gonna do about this water crisis? And spending money on these analyses and these you know, efforts and da 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 And Cheryl and her colleagues were like, well, why don't we just go ask the women? Because I guarantee you the women are gonna know where the water solutions, where the water sources are. So sure enough, they went into these communities and they were asking women who were, um, you know, indeed, whether it was taking them hours and hours longer, which was the case to find water, they were finding the water and sure enough, they led them straight to the boreholes, they led them, the, the decision makers and, and programmers, they led them straight to the sources of water, and those are the stories we are trying to reflect in real terms in policy. Thank you very much. Well, speaking of stories, if you can briefly talk about your own, how do you go from managing a theater company to becoming uh, an advocacy uh, specialist? Um, life is very strange, and that's the beautiful part of life, is that you can make mistakes and find your way. It took me about 10 years to figure out what I really wanted to do. I was an actor, I was a founding member of a theater company in New York, I loved it, I was incredibly passionate about it, and yet I felt totally disconnected, and I was really getting bored with myself. I was really getting bored with the lifestyle and thinking, oh man, there's more out there. So very naive, do-gooder. I joined the Peace Corps and I thought I was doing the right thing and I was working, I, I wanted to work in community empowerment, I wanted to work in women's rights, I wanted to work in reproductive health and, and rights and I was working in a community health and uh, reproductive health um, initiative 
and um, which is all good. That's not to say anything bad about any of any of those things. I wanted to work on women's rights, but I was a complete failure because I nobody was coming to my classes, nobody was coming to my um, my programs, and you know I was talking to the girls and you know trying to be very inspiring and invigorating and the importance of education and da 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 da, and they didn't have time because they were collecting water literally they didn't have time they didn't go to school because they were collecting water all day i lived up in the mountains in a very very rural west africa um and the boys let's not leave the boys out the boys had a very s a similar in their challenges but different in the actuality of it um they would drop in and out of of schools and classes because their work was in the fields so i just realize I saw with my own eyes this very gender differentiated division of labor which is now the language we use in policy spheres but it's real it's real and if you are trying to work on very important things like maternal health and um, and uh, um, education you know there's this foundation of environmental instability and insecurity that is really eroding um, these other programs in my experiences I've seen well, thank you very much for those insights. Olimar, uh, let's talk about Sustain US and uh, how it has come about and what's your engagement like and where, where is it uh, making a big push? So, good morning, everybody. Um, Sustain US, it's a US-based organization. We are all youth volunteers. We are based everywhere in, in throughout the United States. We started our work right after the Sustainable Development Conference of Rio on 92. So that's more than 20 years ago. Uh, and the idea that our funders had behind Sustain US is that there's not a specific youth constituency in the United Nations. They kept telling us that youth are the future, youth are the leaders of tomorrow, but there was not a space for us in the table. People were not listening to the things that we consider were priorities. So throughout those years, Sustain US and other organizations throughout the world were working on trying to create that space. Currently, we are working within the UN structure of major groups, which states that um, every constituency, women, children, and youth scientists have, need to have like that representation at the UN level, because all of their opinions and their priorities are important. And if we have more diversity at the table, decisions are better and people feel empowered to, to take part of the work that it's needed um, to make those programs successful. Currently, we have uh, brought over 500 young people from the US to different UN, UN negotiation meetings. We're working with the Commission on Su uh, Sustainable Development, which is the more related to water. We are also very active on the climate change negotiation. A couple of years ago, uh, uh, some of our members working with the, with the Chinese youth, created the official Jungo, who's the, who's the official body that represents youth at uh, the UN um, COP conferences. And this was a huge step, because it was the first time that the UN negotiators have to, to listen to, to the opinions about, that you had about climate change, including water. And we have lots of plans, uh, we have lots of idea, but the most important is that we have discovered that the way that our domestic policy works really limits the ability of our negotiators to act when they're at the UN. We have a baseline and that's basically what Congress says and the laws that we have right now, it's what's gonna limit what our negotiators can do when they're overseas at these negotiations. So how can we expect, for example, for the US to have a climate change um, global treaty when we don't even have one uh, uh, at the domestic level. So now we are pushing um, to create a domestic delegation that it's going to work with different uh, members of Congress, try to advocate to the White House to push for a climate change treaty at the, at the local level so we can have more, more to negotiate when we're at global negotiations. And why is this important? Why it's important that we are at the table? It's not because I'm young and I want to be part of the negotiations. It's simple. I mean, most of these negotiators are going to retire in, what, 10, 15 years? And we don't want to have those discussions 15 years again on the road. Oh, climate change is important. We need to do 
something about it. We want to start getting involved in the discussions right now so we can keep working together and making progress. Because right now, especially at the UN, what it's happening is that negotiation, like negotiations are going on a cycle. We're not moving forward because people keep changing and they keep having the same discussions all over again. And we want to put a stop into that and just start bringing new generations, more, getting more people involved so we can finally uh, create a plan of implementation which is needed at this point. Um, and what are we doing about water? Um, basically, water is in, it's very important when you're talking about climate change because water quantities are going down and people are expecting that oil population, it's increasing resources. Uh, the resources need of that growing population are gonna go up. So we need to figure out how we're gonna balance the needs that we have as a population with what is available on the planet. And that might change for a nation as the United States, where the water crisis is not about access, but rather about how we become um, smarter about the way we consume, how we look at our infrastructure, and make sure that we're wasting less, as opposed to places like Africa and Latin America, where the crisis is still about people that don't have access to water. Um, when you were mentioning that story about the schools in, in Africa where people didn't think about building a bathroom when there were girls there, you, it really like hits you that there needs to be a more holistic understanding of the way that we are going about in development. And that story has a very positive side because I have heard about communities in Africa that are actually coming together and pooling resources so they can build the bathrooms in the school and girls have a chance to, to go to school and learn and become agents of change. Yeah, thank you. And I think uh, from both you and Kate, it's very interesting to hear you talk about uh, working at the UN uh, uh, or working with the UN. And I've been at the UN for 15 years and I, I can tell you that this is something that we appreciate very much, that the uh, civil society is now very much engaged and, and is empowering some of the dialogues which are going on. And speaking of dialogues, you also mentioned the, the original Rio summit. And I wanted to ask you about the Rio Plus 20 summit, which was in July last year, um, and which um, some people thought was not so successful. And it was quite remarkable that uh, some of the global leaders like uh, uh, UK's David Cameron, uh, US President Obama, were simply not present. So what's, what's your view of that? And were you at Rio? What, what did you think? Um, I was present at Rio Plus 20, and I was also part of the process that took place before that, where the actual negotiations were taking place, which is something that people don't tend to know about the UN. These big conferences are the end of the road, but the year before that, you have negotiators meeting every month, every two months, going through the document and trying to um, actually talk about the different issues that they need to, to discuss before the conference so they can have an agreement at that point. Um, Rio was a great experience, particularly because you can see the progress on how civil society is engaged and about how we are discussing topics like climate change that were not really part of the original document. We're not talking about how water is connected to agriculture, to energy production, and those discussions were not taking place 20 years ago. It was successful in the fact that we were talking and incorporating new topics into, into, uh, into a global agreement, and that was the first time that was happening. When we were talking about reproductive rights on a sustainable development agreement, when we're starting to see the world as a holistic place where everything is interconnected. Um, it could have been more, we could have done much more, but um, I think that that's our responsibility as a generation. We think and we view the world very differently and that's the opportunity that we have to, to move toward that implementation. And President Obama wasn't there, um, but he's not the person in charge of like really thinking through. I don't see President Obama as our climate change expert. He's our president and he's our leader. But when, I'm, when I view as a researcher who I want at that table negotiating, it's the experts, the people from, our, from the Department of State, from the Department of Interior that actually know their issues and that know what is possible. 
I understand the significance of having the president there because it shows commitment. But if we don't have the knowledge that is needed at that table, then that really doesn't end anywhere. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Gemma, let's talk about the Global Women's Water Initiative. And uh, if you can talk a little bit about your journey from uh, starting at the Philippines level and taking the initiative global and, and what kind of things you're engaged in now. Um, I also want to echo Kate's uh, surprise and delight of being here. I think it's such an honor to be sitting in a room of, you know, our future leaders, not even our future leaders, our now leaders who are really taking steps that I, at your age, didn't even think about. So thank you all for being so awesome. Um, uh, I actually, uh, the Global Women's Water Initiative, let me tell you a little bit about that first. What we do is we train uh, women in East Africa currently how to be water and sanitation and hygiene experts and implementers. So uh, we work on the ground. We're, our work is really about building capacity of the stakeholders on the ground to be able to, to uh, implement the most efficient solutions that are locally driven, locally managed, and locally um, uh, designed. And so for us, uh, it's really focusing on building the capacity of women to have a voice at the table. Um, because in general, what you uh, often see when there are sort of water projects or water organizations going into communities uh, to make uh, some sort of decision on what is going to be done there, oftentimes their, their gender um, and their women in water program is simply inviting women to be uh, having a quota of women at the table. Um, oftentimes it's not because they have any expertise, it's because they because they're women, and it's simply because they're women. Um, not saying simply because they're women they don't have information, of course they do, they have, they know where the water sources are, they know where the clean water is, they know the amount of time it takes, they know the kinds of uh, illnesses or challenges uh, their families and their communities will have because they have dirty water. But what we are looking at is building their capacity, so not only are they invited at the table because they're women, they're invited to the table because they have solutions. and really efficient solutions that can actually benefit the entire community. And that to me is a much louder voice than just saying I'm a woman and I need to have, you know, I need to have a seat at the table because I'm a woman, because I'm affected by this. I'm invited to this table not only because I know this, this challenge firsthand, I'm the one who is the most of in, impacted by it, but I also have solutions. So that makes their voice even louder. And that for us is, you know, it's great for us to hear what's happening with Oli's and and Kate's organizations because we're the kind of stakeholders that will be important at the decision-making table at Rio, at the decision-making table at WeDo. So for us, it really is about building the capacity of women to be able to provide not only what the community needs in terms of water, because this is not, this has gone beyond need, this is demand. So when you're looking at what the demand of the community is, having clean water, having toilets, having things like that, that's, if you, when you're meeting a demand, there's much more interest in the community to listen to what you have to say, especially when you have something that's useful. So for us, the way we work with the women is not only, uh, so uh, our ultimate goal obviously is to have, you know, everybody on the planet to be able to have clean water and sanitation. Um, our way of doing it is to work with women because again women are the ones who are most impacted by by uh, the lack of water and sanitation they're the ones do, who do all the water related chores so they're cleaning they're cooking they're washing they're bathing the children they're caretakers of their household so um, when somebody falls sick they're the ones who have to lose work or income because they're either spending money on clinics or medicines or they're taking time out to take care of them um, and so of course they're the ones who are going to we have the most vested interest in finding solutions. So not only are they going to think about finding solutions, they're going to want to have solutions that they can, they can maintain, that they can have access to very simply, and that they can actually uh, be the ones to, to um, implement. So for us, looking at, um, uh, looking at women in water solutions, it's more of a practical thing than it is a gender thing. You know, it's, they're the ones, they're the ones who have uh, the most interest. So our entree into being able to provide 
clean water and sanitation to communities is through the women. And not only is it because they, um, because people need to have clean water and sanitation, we're talking also about institutionalizing this knowledge. You know, um, Oli was saying how you don't want to have to keep teaching this uh, information every generation. You want this to be passed on and institutionalized like it is in the, in the countries that we live in. You know, we already know that we're supposed to wash our hands after going to the bathroom. We know all of these things that are, that are important for us to do in terms of water sanitation and hygiene. And that currently is not what's happening in developing countries. Well, we were lucky enough to have Wangari Maathai actually be part of our uh, first women in water training in Kenya back in 2008. And she says, I've been doing this work for decades. And we were talking about water 20 years ago, and we're still talking about water. So it really is about institutionalizing this knowledge and passing it down. And who better to do this kind of institutionalization of hygiene, institutionalization of, of, of you know, water solutions and sanitation solutions, but through the women and through the mothers and through the girls. So our goal is really to look at um, making, uh, you know, uh, uh, being able to build the capacity of women to be those, uh, those knowledge sharers, those uh, water champions, those people who are going to make sure that that knowledge is passed from generation to generation. Because we can't count on our governments. We can't count, especially in rural areas where, you know, most of these communities are so, uh, uh, people live so far away from each other. They're very widespread. Not everyone's going to school, so you're not going to get it at school. You have to learn it at the household. So um, in terms of my background, uh, before this, uh, before working and uh, directing the Global Women's Water Initiative, uh, I had founded an organization called the Single Drop for Safe Water in the Philippines. And I had actually no background in development, water, engineering, sanitation, nothing. And um, I was actually a professional jazz singer and a preschool teacher <laughs> in New York City. Who knew? So yeah, maybe we did work together in New York. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> That's where we know each other. Maybe we did some silly show. So, <laughs> um, but, um, so I actually was supposed to be in the World Trade Center when the planes hit. So that was you know, the day that changed everybody's lives. And for me, the way it changed my life was that I... Uh, I saw this, the way I had to see the world after that it may not be how everybody else saw the world, but the way I needed to see it in order for me to, to start my own personal healing was that I saw this, in, this was not a way that people were being divided. In New York, people were connecting. They were connecting because they're, they were grieving together. They were connecting and realizing that we all wanted the same things. We wanted the same things for our families, you know, opportunities, uh, food, water, shelter, all of these things. And that was what made us all the same. And incidentally, I wrote a song called We Rise. It, it, that's my way of sort of uh, my starting my healing is to, 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 is to do it through music. And it just so happened that the lyrics to the song or one of the themes to the song was this notion that it takes a single drop of water to start a wave. And I had this crazy notion that I was going to go around the world and build a million voice choir around the world to sing it. So I left my life and um, gave away all my belongings and took my guitar and backpack and started to invite people to be part of it. Inviting them to see themselves, using water as that metaphor, to, see each per to invite people to see themselves as that drop of water. That our every thought, that our every word, our every action is that drop. And I started to get known as the water lady, the lady singing for water. And so I was invited to the United Nations to sing, um, uh, to sing We Rise there. And what was interesting was that was when I learned about the water crisis, that I learned that at the time there were 1.2 billion people who didn't have access to water, three to five million dying of water-related disease. So it made perfect sense that I started to look into water, um, water solutions as, as, or water as my personal cause. So as a first-generation Filipino-American, I actually wanted to uh, start thinking about what kinds of solutions were out there and I met someone who actually trained people how to build what are called biosand filters. They're really simple uh, uh, modified slow sand water filters that can be built from local materials uh, using just sand and gravel and cement. And they can be built virtually anywhere in the world and they're actually a really great uh, alternative for, for water treatment. So I thought I had 
the golden ticket. I thought I had the silver bullet, you know, we're going to save the world and I'm going to get the Nobel Peace Prize because I've got this solution. So we went there thinking that we would, you know, train in the technology. All we had to do was train people and then boom, they could go off and do their own thing. Yay us. That was so not the case. <laughs> I mean, it's, let's talk about failures and let's talk about, you know, just going in with these presumptions that you, you have the answers as a, you know, um, even though I was Filipino, I was still an American and going in there with these ideas that I know what you need. And so um, w when we first uh, offered the trainings, the, 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 you know, the, the, right after the training, the difficulties were people starting. I mean, the, the, the hardest thing for anyone to do is to, when they learn something, it's like, how do you take your first step? What's, what's the first step look like? So everybody was having challenges around how to implement that technology. And so what we did was we started to focus more on uh, uh, training people because the technology was only going to be part of the solution because you know without proper maintenance without proper use without understanding how the technology worked you know there was uh, the, uh, very little could actually happen um, or there's more uh, at risk of, of the, the, the initiative failing so we looked at trying to build uh, we were worked with the community and asked them is this something that you need and, and when they did decide that it was something that they need, then we started to help them build a community-based water organization that really looked at what their, what their actual issues were and how to design and plan something that um, would benefit the community and also generate income from them. And from that, we actually started to add different uh, technologies to our roster because obviously not the biosand filter was not going to be the only uh, solution in any one community. One community had lots of water, but it was dirty, so the biosand filter was perfect there. Another didn't have any water at all, so building a spring development, you know, system that uh, pumped water, that, that, uh, that was gravity fed and brought water directly to the community, that was a solution that they did. Another community, theirs was more about, they had all these open dug wells and um, realized that they had Already, they already had water access. They had thought about building a whole new system, but when we did our training with them and they realized they already had existing sources, all they had to do was find a solution to protect it and to, and to make sure that it was going to be long-lasting and generate income, that's what they did. So it was really more about trusting the wisdom of the community. They know what they want. You know, we just have a couple of things that we may be able to offer that will help them think about what their solutions are and how much more efficiently or or how much it can strengthen what they're already doing. So that's really what we're looking at, is just trusting the wisdom of the community. Okay, thank you. That, that's an incredible story. And, <laughs> and thanks for sharing uh, you know, how, what kind of challenges you've faced and, and how you've gone about overcoming them. I think when now we move to actually a very open conversation and a dialogue that engages all of you uh, with the panelists as well. And uh, so if you have any questions or comments, uh, you know, it would be good to, to get you uh, engaged in that conversation. So I see already three, four hands. So we start up here. Uh, good morning, and uh, I'm Johannes Paulus. Uh, and I want to appreciate you guys for giving the uh, this wonderful conversation about water. And uh, my question is, uh, in the last one to two years, there has been this recent water crisis in the Sahara region of Africa. And a lot of children died. And uh, so my question is, you c we cannot isolate the fact that women don't have access to land and just deal with the water part of it. Because I think they are in interconnected. And uh, in, in, a, in the region where I come from, women, they are regarded as, you know, they don't have access to land, the men do. And that's something which it's a great deal because with land, you can build wells. A lot of these women would want, you know, to build underground water for their children or for their farms, but they don't have access to because of those traditional norms. So, what are you guys doing to incorporate the fact that uh, land and access to land actually should be part of the water solution, especially when dealing with women? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent point. Uh, we'll take three or four questions together, and then we'll go back to the panel. There was a hand in the back there. Yeah. So if you can please be brief in describing your, your question, and if you can make it very specific. 
Hello, my name is Nicole Elenoff. What are you all doing to protect women in water from corporations like Coca-Cola when they go into communities and take all of that community's water and pump back waste? Okay, thank you. And then there was a back, back. Okay. Hi, um, my question is for Gemma to expand on how, um, how you start that conversation with communities about community-specific solutions. Um, I work for an organization that has schools in Uganda, and we've seen some great water solutions, but I've had trouble finding a way to create that conversation so that the community comes to the solution by themselves. Okay, thank you. And then there was a hand up here somewhere. Uh, here. Hi, thank you very much for your comments. Um, my question is, how do you switch from a normal day job like you guys had to, um, which seems to be a standard income generating livelihood for um, people in the United States to something that is um, seen as much more giving and often not a livelihood for students in the United States? Okay, great, I'll bring it back to the panel and I'll ask you to stay within like a 30 second answer so that we can have another round of uh, questions. So maybe Gemma, you can start because there was one question pointed at you directly. Sure, I'll do very specific about yours. I'm gonna tell you a story of, uh, so what we do is we train women who are actually working in the community. Our, we're one sort of uh, step away from the community because we don't know about it. So the women that we train are leaders who are already there. I'm gonna tell you a story about, it, actually in Uganda, about how these women leaders who we trained went to, the, uh, went to the, 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 uh, school principal of a school that had a women's dorm, a girls' dorm. And what they were finding, the nurse was saying that they had challenges in um, women, uh, girls go, having to miss school for three and a half hours a day because they had to go fetch water. They were at risk of getting, having inappropriate sexual relations. They uh, lost a lot of money because um, uh, girls were getting sick from the dirty water. They also had issues of, of the... Um, the, the food not being ready because there was no water and girls, up to five girls fainting a day um, because they were dehydrated during the this, this session. So even then, even having girls stay at the school wasn't a guarantee that they were gonna have a good education so, or guarantee that they could be present, really present in school to learn and focus. And uh, they had a discussion with the, with the principal or the headmaster and the, um, the, the women we trained, they all decided to put the tank, not just for the school, but just for the, the girls' dorm. Because, um, and it was their decision, it wasn't anyone else's, we didn't go in there with a suggestion. And because of that, the, uh, the reduction of disease reduced, uh, there was a reduction of disease, um, they were able to save thousands of dollars in, um, in healthcare fees, and, they were, and the community loved the idea so much, they actually uh, brought in, they were the ones who do donated all the materials. And um, because of all that money they saved, the community is now building a borehole that uh, will service the entire community. It's, it was incredible how just the one thing, just putting it on a very specific building, just the girl's dorm, impacted the entire community. Okay. Kate or Olimar, if you wanna talk about switching jobs or any of the other questions you wanna. Switching okay. jobs, well, I'll come back to that one later, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll touch on a couple of them. The, the question about land rights is such an important one. I, I mean, by the UN's latest tally, women own just about 2% of the world's land, which is almost unfathomable, really. Um, going into Rio Plus 20, we did, um, with a bunch of partners, we did this massive survey, and we got tremendous, substantive, I mean, incredible responses from hundreds and hundreds of women from around the world, and water and land rights and violence, which let's remember that in times of environmental fragility, um, rates of violence against women skyrocket. Um, these were the top issues of women from all over the world, women and, and, and their gender equality allies. I want to emphasize that. Gender equality allies don't have to just be women. Um, 
these are such important issues, and um, I think that, especially in, in global policy making spheres, we're getting a little better at talking about the intersections of these things. I mean, who has access to natural resources? Who provides natural resources? Getting to the question about privatization. Um, uh, there's a, a, an incredible organization called the Niger Delta Women's Project, who just finally won a lawsuit against Shell. They've been working against uh, Shell to the oil company um, to highlight the the egregious effects of this industry on local populations. They just had this tremendous win. I would encourage you to look them up. Um, a partner of ours, Norma Maldonado, an indig from a, an indigenous um, organization in Guatemala, she tells this amazing story about how she, this empowered, educated, incredibly well-connected woman, wakes up at 3 a.m. every day to get her water because at 5 or 6 a.m. when all the businesses start up, there's no water for the families. So I think getting all of these stories out and, and making the connections is, um, is really essential, and I thank you for the, for the questions. Um, going back to the land and water rights, that is a very important issue. Uh, we're currently working on something called the water, the water, Food, and Energy Nexus, which is really being put by the European nation. And what that really, uh, the whole point behind that is that you need to like start thinking outside of the water sector to find solutions for water. Looking at land rights, looking at how agriculture production works and who it's working there. Um, so you can start thinking uh, how to bring other sectors and how you, you, you look at your water solutions. And the whole wonky side of that is that when you're working with specific communities or specific counties, you need to understand what are the legislations so the people that are being affected by it understand what is their right and understand what are the opportunities that they have to to change that legislation. Because at the end, uh, land rights it's related to how legislations are done on the national level, and you and that's how you make the change in that area. You need to start connecting people that are affected by that program and bringing them to like the decision makers and try to fix the legislation that it's creating that or created or or promote that change. For the privatization one, I was working last year with um, the campaign against the Velo Monte Dam in Brazil, which is one of the most destructive projects that have been developed in Brazil. And we have a lot of technology, which is something that I learned while I was working with uh, International Rivers, who was the organization um, promoting this campaign. Technology, social media helps you connect with a lot of communities that are also being affected by similar projects. And unifying that voice and bringing it to forums to talk about it really creates an impact because it puts a pressure on the, on the companies. They are put, they're literally putting a light on them and, and showing their world that they're doing a terrible job. So that at least is gonna help slow down the process while you try to figure out other solutions about that. For changing careers, I'm still 25 years old and <laughs> still trying to figure out exactly how I can be more effective by, by what I'm doing. But I have learned that there's a lot of money out there if you have really good ideas or if you have a path that you want to take and you need to like connect with that at least so you can support yourself while you're trying to like change the world. As a grad student, there's lots of grants out there, lots of scholarships that at least are gonna help you like pay your, pay your bills, um, pay for your, for your housing while you work with different communities abroad and even in the United States. So uh, that's a way to start from there. And if you have, I think this is something that every speaker has said so far, if you have like a really good idea and you know how to like implement it, you need to be certain that there's gonna be someone that is gonna like help you. Uh, supported either financially or by contacting with other people and it starts with conference like this when you can connect with people that are interested in the same issues as you when they're amazing speakers that have already discovered some of that path so take this opportunity to like talk to them and try to figure out how how they got where they are today yeah, thank you very much and I'll maybe add uh, another point about the question around uh, engagement of the private sector I think there's a little bit more nuanced uh, view that we have to take of engaging the private sector. There are certain uh, technologies, capacities, and resources that the private sector has, 
and they need to be somehow engaged in finding the solution. The, the challenge is, and, and I think we're getting better at that, is to find ways of engaging that those resources without really undermining people's rights and, and people's uh, ability to manage their own destinies. There were some, some failures, if I can call them that, uh, in, in big uh, uh, locations like in, in Paris, like in London, where private sector's engagement in water uh, really turned out to be disastrous. But there are now also a lot of success stories in developing countries where private sector is being brought in with oversight from the public sector. And, and that has uh, also uh, a powerful way of uh, resolving some of the challenges. Now, what we're going to do now uh, in a moment is to uh, go to uh, uh, table discussions, and, and you will uh, have an opportunity to discuss ideas amongst yourselves. Uh, but before we do that, let me just take one more quick round of questions, uh, and we'll address them after the roundtable uh, conversation. Okay, so I see one, two, three, four, five hands. Okay, so if you can be very brief. Uh, uh, thank you for coming and presenting to us. My question is, what sort of criteria do you have in place to measure the impact of your, of your services and programs? And then there was a hand in the back. Oh. Okay, well, you in the middle. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Um, I'm Sally Matthew from IDEO. My question is, I'm curious, what are some specific policies that you're really excited about around water and women in water? Okay, and then there were two hands in the back. Uh, the gentleman standing up and the lady sitting on the table up front. Okay, and I'll come back to you. Hi, my name is Lars. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned about the dam project in Brazil. I'm concerned about uh, this issue of uh, governments having to hand out water bodies to companies who sometimes make water and sell back to the people. Are you aware of anything that has been done on the policy level at international uh, United Nations to solve this problem? Because it's really a big problem in some countries around the world. Thank you. And on the table here. Hi, my name is Tangina. My question is, with the current global climate change, many fresh water sources are disappearing. If you have any solutions for that or have it, um, made any efforts in that area. Sorry, could you please repeat the first part of your question? With the current global uh, climate change, many fresh water areas are disappearing in um, certain villages in like, I know in um, the Asian areas. If you've come across any ideas or have any programs in those um, related to so. Okay, great. And the last question uh, up here in the middle with the lady. Um, okay. Bolivia, um, where privatization sector came in um, under the auspice of the World Bank in order to privatize water, then you had the revolts happening because of the increases in prices. But now coming back, you have the lack of infrastructure and the lack of uh, economic investment to go back into that infrastructure. How do we overcome that? How do we get new infrastructure in developing countries without raising water prices to the people who need it the most while still planning for the long-term future of those same people? Okay, so what we will do... Uh those are really interesting questions, and what we will do is uh, give each table about 10 minutes to talk about around some of those issues, and I'll invite the panelists to join your tables, and of course we can't be in, in all the tables, uh, and, and then in, in 10 minutes we'll, we'll come back, we'll try to answer some of these questions as briefly as we can, because we're running uh, really out of time. So <laughs> your, your 10 minutes start now. Okay, thank you very much. So if we can have your attention back here. We're, 
we started a few minutes late, but we still have to finish on time. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm cutting off some really interesting discussions that, that you're having. And I presume that those will continue over lunch. I know I and the panelists will be also available afterwards. So um, we'll be quite happy to interact with you uh, informally outside of the session as well. Uh, so let me start with giving about a minute uh, to, to each of the panelists to give their concluding thoughts and maybe roll in uh, very brief answers to the questions that were posed just before we uh, went into the breakout session. So Kate, why don't we start with you? Okay, and I'm a fast talker, so I think I can cram a lot in, just 16 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna deal with a couple of questions as my last, my last hurrah. The issue of measuring, what do we measure? What do we measure is a part of being held accountable, and what we measure is a political choice. So yes, you have to appease your donors. You have to make your quantifiable you know, indicators and, and all of that. But we should be pushing much, much more. It's not just about how many students are going to school, what kind of quality of education are they getting. Yes, how many women are, can access water? Is it safe water? Is it potable water? These qualitative things need to be addressed as well as quantitative. On policies I'm excited about, um, together with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, we've been doing um, participatory multi-stakeholder workshops in countries working on gender and climate change action plans. We do had the incredible privilege of, of co-authoring and fostering the process in Haiti. In all of these different countries, Mexico's another one, um, water has been prioritized. So this is incredibly exciting to me because the water sector is getting engaged in climate, real practical climate change planning and, and programming. And my last possible note is don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Just go for it. Gemma. Uh, so I'm going to address a few of these questions, measurement and um, access uh, and how we do it. We're, what we do is we don't, uh, because we're training women, we're, we're talking about women who'd never picked up shovels before. So we're teaching them to build technologies that are simple enough to build. And so these are more often self-supply um, options. They're not community ones, because the community ones, if they're big, they have to be maintained. There has to be income to hire someone to maintain them. They need to have available parts, things like that. We're looking at self-supply, the supply of just a household or a school. And uh, so that comes in the form of rainwater harvesting or whatever. So our measurement, because we're training women, it's, uh, you know, our, and our ultimate goal is for people to actually have access to clean water and sanitation. Ours is really looking at the, um, our measurement is, 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 is women's uh, voice in the sector. It's actually women being able to, pro the, the number of people they've been able to provide, um, you know, uh, water and sanitation for. It's really looking at their capacity to construct, their capacity to earn income doing it, because we've, what we've seen with a lot of our, our, the women that we train, they actually have professionalized their services. They are actually getting government contracts and contracts from NGOs to build. And um, uh, they are also selling, you know, water-related pro products like um, uh, soap that they're making and and uh, reusable sanitary pads. So things like that, finding ways that they can generate income at the self-supply point of use level. Because when you're talking about a, 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 a householder or a school owning a system that they've either paid for or they've been able to get subsidized, they're, they're, you better bet they're more likely to take care of it. You better bet they're more likely going to make sure that it's, it's working and that they're going to be getting the income that they want to get from it. So our, our thing is that we, we work in community when we start engaging them in conversation. It's not about what do we lack. It's what do we have here? What do we have here that we can use? What are the, what are the resources that we have and how do we harness them into ways that are going to meet not only our needs but our demands? So that's sort of my little two cents for you guys. Thank you. And Olimar, you get the final 60 minutes. So the final uh, 60 minute. 60 seconds, um, I'm sorry. Measure and impact is super important because that's how you know if your project works and if you can uh, try to apply it to another context. In terms of gender, gender disaggregated data, it's super useful to try to figure out what are the specific impacts uh, that your specific project is having on women. About policies that I'm very excited about, there's, a, there's this huge discussion at the UN uh, about the sustainable development goals, which are or supposedly will take over the MDGs. And why I'm excited about, because that's really going to define how the international community will use their resources to meet the development challenges that we have on the next 25, 50 years. And they're really interested in having this discussion with civil society, particularly with 
young people to understand like what are the challenges that we perceive we need to like address in this next 50 years. Okay, thank you. Let me maybe close uh, with, a, uh, with a thought to remind you that when we talk about water issues, we have to think of its linkages with everything else. And there are three particular nexuses or nexi that I would like to uh, draw your attention to. First, the nexus between water and climate change. Climate change is an important issue, but to an average person, it's not about whether it's two degrees warmer on average or six degrees warmer on average. It's what happens to their water availability when it comes in, when they have floods, when they have droughts. Second nexus, the nexus between water, food, and energy. And that's absolutely critical uh, because if you don't have good water, uh, you can't grow food. Uh, if you don't have enough water, you can't even produce energy. And you need energy to produce food, and you need energy to produce water. So th th there's a nice triangle. And the time for treating this, the elements or the apexes of this triangle separately are gone. You have to really think about how the, the, three, tri the three links work with each other. And the, uh, the final nexus is between water, sanitation, hygiene, and human health. Uh, although about two billion people have received water uh, through improved source in the last uh, 20 years, two billion, so that's a huge number, we still have not seen a remarkable or a comparable drop in health indicators. And the reason why that hasn't happened is that the sanitation, the toilets, and the hygiene bit has been missing. There's still two and a half billion people without access to sanitation. So please do keep in mind that we do have to bring in all these, these, these next side. And uh, again, uh, women has a, have a very central role in, in building connections around these. So I would like to join me, uh, join you, um, you joining me in thanking the panelists for, for their excellent comments.